Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Ryan Higgins, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Molecular Labs webinar on understanding why inf infections trigger autoimmune encephalitis and neuropsychiatric disorders, and how the Pun Cunningham panel can aid in your diagnosis and treatment. If at any time you have questions, please utilize the chat or Q&A function. And we'll either answer them either on the spot or during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. There will also be a recording of this webinar sent out within two or three days to all attendees. Leading today's discussion is Dr. Craig Shimasaki. As a brief bio, Dr. Shimasaki is co-founder and CEO of Molecular Labs, a neuro immunology precision medicine company focused on identifying underlying roots of neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders triggered by an autoimmune response. Dr. Shimasaki started his career at Genetech and has been in the biotechnology industry for over 35 years. As a scientist, his work spans all stages of research and development from bench to bedside. His research included epitope mapping for an HIV vaccine, genetic breast cancer risk prediction biomarkers, a rapid influenza diagnostic, and therapeutics for infectious diseases, neuropsychiatric disorders, and noise-induced hearing loss. As a business person, he co-founded multiple companies and led multiple products through the FDA approval process and is co-inventor on multiple patents. Dr. Shimasaki received his BS in biochemistry from the University of California at Davis, his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Tulsa, and his MBA from Northwestern's Kellogg School of Business. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma, Price School of Business, and teaches biotechnology entrepreneurship. His passion is to help translate scientific and medical discoveries into acutely needed products so that more patients can live healthier lives. So without further delay, Dr. Shimasaki, welcome, and the floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan. I'm going to switch over to my slides here, and I trust you can see them okay? We can, thank you. All right, very good. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you all, and uh, thank you for joining. I look forward to sharing with you some information that I hope will be valuable and informational to you as you do you uh, have your practice, and uh, come across patients that have uh, sometimes uh, perplexing and complex disorders whether they be neurologic, psychiatric, or behavioral disorders. And I wanna share with you a bit about the biology and then how uh, the targets in our panel will actually help uh, identify not only which symptoms, but maybe even help direct the treatment and then also lead uh, in the future, um, better treatment care and other diagnostic tools. So with that, uh, my obligate disclosure here, I'm co-founder and CEO of Molecular Labs. Uh, we do uh, run the Cunningham panel and uh, any data that I'll share with you today will be from peer-reviewed publications or current research. Also, uh, the disclaimer here is that uh, although the content will be provided here for medical professionals, it's not a substitute or not intended to be able to diagnose patients um, from this webinar. So there are about five topics we're gonna to cover today in general. Uh, I really wanna start with the basic of how our immune system is really able to recognize any conceivable antigen and how it responds um, so, I, <clears throat> so discreetly uh, and is prepared for really any antigen prior to its encounter. This leads to really an understanding of how molecular mimicry and how this process uh, can produce autoantibodies that are directed towards self. And then we'll uh, move into how certain infections and why they tend to be uh, identified in patients with various neurologic and psychiatric syndromes, such as PANDAS and PANS and neurologic Lyme, and even more uh, recently, long COVID. Then we'll touch on how the targets in the Cunningham panel can be utilized to help identify uh, and direct treatment towards your patients with immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders. And then I'll briefly touch on the categories of therapeutic modalities uh, that have been shown to be effective in patients with these autoimmune encephalopathies. So uh, with that, uh, let's begin here. So just as a background, 
Uh, one thing we do know, and as science and medicine progresses, we know that the immune system and really other, uh, the other systems in our body don't act independently. Um, so the immune system we know is involved in the gut and the digestive system. In fact, about two thirds of the gut uh, it contains uh, some immunological components. Uh, and then we know it affects the endocrine system. We're gonna talk briefly about how the immune system interconnects with the nervous system and even with the cardiovascular system. So the point being is that uh, these integrated systems of our body actually impact each other and treated in isolation, um, it, it, we lose or miss out uh, on some of the understanding of the underlying biology. Well, metal, medical specialization has helped dramatically in uh, understanding medicine and helping patients recover, but there's also a clinical challenge to medical specializations. So just for instance, these four, infectious disease, immunology, neurology, and psychiatry, uh, tend to be thought of or operated in, uh, in somewhat isolation, meaning that uh, it, it's not necessarily completely recognized or even practiced clinically that systems such as infectious disease, psychiatry, and neurology, and even immunology uh, are interrelated in how they can impact each other. Now, many of you here on this webinar are, are actually operating under that uh, knowledge and uh, presumption. And the good thing is that when you have an understanding of systems biology, it can actually help accelerate the diagnosis and treatment of these chronic disorders. So the question is, how does our immune system really recognize any foreign antigen and respond appropriately? Uh, well, our immune system has an enormous diversity of both T cell and B cells. And these precursors are actually uh, there uh, to, to respond to any current and even future infectious agent or antigen that it might come in contact with. So how does it do that? Well, our immune system recognizes, uh, in some cases, it's estimated to be five times 10 to the 13th unique antigens. Uh, and some estimates is even maybe uh, four or five or six logs more than that. So it, back to a little bit of genetics and biology, uh, the diversity of the antibodies and the T and the B cell recognition sites are created by the shuffling of genes for what these segments call B, D, J, and these constant regions. So you can see here the numbers in, in some cases here, 30 to 38 uh, for the B gene, uh, the numbers for the other, just by sheer random reassortment, the diversity is created within these variable regions and kind of illustrated here pictorially in the colors, you can come up with an infinite number of uh, connections or, or different types of connections between these different genes that result in that diversity. And so this really brings us to that our immune system is pre-programmed to recognize any antigen that it would see or could see in the future. And that therefore it's ready in that case um, to be able to go through what we call clonal expansion once it identifies a particular target. Unfortunately, this also means that it is pre-programmed with self-reactive lymphocytes in the process. In fact, it's believed that the majority of these um, T and B cells that are uh, created through rearrangements are actually self-reactive. So then how does our body eliminate these self-reactive immune cells? In other words, what we think of as this self-non-self discrimination. Well, it does it through two mechanisms. One is called central tolerance. And that's where most of these self-reactive early lymphocytes are eliminated. And that occurs through two parts of the body, in the bone marrow and the thymus. And in the bone marrow, uh, the uh, uh, early stage and immature B cells are being uh, presented with self-antigen. And if self-antigen is recognized, then the signal is sent uh, to these B cells to go through a process called energy or basically apoptosis, and then they will die. Uh, likewise, the T cells, which go through maturation in the thymus, a very similar process will occur in the T cells. Uh, 
a self antigen will be presented to them. If it recognizes self antigen, then they will be triggered and uh, destined to die. So there is a backup system, and that's what, what's called peripheral tolerance. And this is where the T cells and B cells might escape the central tolerance. And uh, this actually occurs in the spleen and the lymph. And if, that, if they make it out of the bone marrow and thymus and they're still self-reactive, uh, what the body has is a system that will also recognize not only whether it binds to self, but the strength of binding to self. And so through energy and deletion and even reassortment, these can be changed or inhibited or actually die. So the take home message is that uh, through this system of reactivity, the body uh, is recognizing what's me and what's not me. And then that is how our, our immune system uh, has the repertoire it needs in order to be presented with any future antigen. So what about autoimmunity? Well, autoimmunity we know exists. There's probably over 800 different types of autoimmune disorders. I'm sorry, about 80 different autoimmune disorders. And there probably is many, many more. But uh, we know that it occurs when there's a breakdown of self, non-self. So if you think of friendly fire in the wartime, uh, this is kind of how we uh, give an analogy to an autoimmune disorder. This is where the most relevant genes and genetic factors uh, have been identified to be the MHC or the major histocompatibility complex genes, or the HLA, the human leukocyte antigen genes, class one and class two. So there seems to be a genetic predisposition in these cases for both autoimmunity, but also what we'll talk about is infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. And this is why you'll see typically a family history of some type of an autoimmune dysfunction in your patients that may be presenting with an immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorder. They may end up with seeing family histories of lupus or MS or even psoriasis or asthma or, or some type of self-non-self -self discrimination. And therefore, as you can imagine, um, this predisposition or susceptibility genetically uh, to uh, self non-self uh, discrimination can result in what we're going to talk about here a little bit more. So let's shift over to the biological mechanism. I mentioned molecular mimicry and how it can lead to autoantibodies. Well, this will take us to the next step of how uh, the self-directed antigens can occur through molecular mimicry. So if you look at what is molecular mimicry, we see molecular mimicry in nature. Uh, we also know that molecular mimicry does occur in infectious agents. So it's really a process where sequence similarities between foreign antigens and self antigens uh, are recognized and then cause T cells and B cells to lead to autoimmunity. Um, there are only 20 letters in our particular mammalian protein alphabet that are used. So if you kind of think about it as an alphabet, at some point in the sequence of these literally billions of genes or billions of proteins rather, that the protein sequence and amino acid sequence will and can be and is identical in some short strings to other organisms, including infectious agents. So what you see here is a couple of parallel sequences that have been identified in different types of sequence structures of protein, whether they be uh, human compared to maybe a bacteria or uh, an, an, another organism, but there will be strings of those that will actually have some sequence similarity. <clears throat> so Antibodies we know are directed against parts of an organism. And in this case, you can see that a bacteria is having uh, an antibody being directed against what we call an epitope. And an epitope is just that particular part of the molecule to which the antibody is directed against. So in a normal infection, there will literally be multiple uh, antigenic sites. Uh, and as we know about SARS-CoV-2 and the spike protein, being used <clears throat> as the principal target for the immunological recognition in vaccines. Uh, 
is because multiple antibodies will be made to different parts of that particular protein. Uh, and that's the normal process. So what happens then is that our immune cell is stimulated, the B cells then uh, begin to uh, replicate and called clonal expansion. And then not only does it generate antibodies, but it also generates memory B cells that will remember if it ever sees this antigen again. So what happens if the particular epitope of that organism, let's say a bacteria, is directed against a sequence or an epitope that is identical to a particular part of a human neuron? Well, clearly what happens is what we call cross-reactivity, or in this case, molecular mimicry, or cross-reactive antibodies, in which the antibody that was directed against a specific epitope of a bacteria is now also recognizing that same epitope that's also found on a, a neuron in our body. This is what we call molecular mimicry. In fact, molecular mimicry is much more common than people really rec recognize because the syndrome is identified in many other chronic disorders like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And in Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's recognized that it's often preceded by most often uh, an intestinal infection called Campylobacter jejuni. You can see other infections that typically are associated with the onset of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, but uh, does it have some homology to uh, parts of our body? Well, it does. So if you look at the core oligosaccharide of Campylobacter jejuni, it is actually identical to the core oligosaccharide called ganglioside GM1, which is a part of the myelin sheath around the nerve. And as you can tell and, and know from clinical work that the uh, degradation of the myelin sheath around the nerve is what contributes to the syndrome of Guillain-Barre. There's also molecular mimicry between strep or group A streptococcal bacteria and self antigens in which this group A carbohydrate and the M protein of which there are many different varieties of, and particularly this is where group A strep uh, continues to be one of the key parts and we'll talk about pandas in a, in a minute. And what we see through molecular mimicry that uh, there is a parts of uh, cardiovascular protein, specifically the heart valve, in which uh, there is cross-reactive epitopes. And this is uh, known as rheumatic, acute rheumatic fever, uh, when the antibodies are directed against the part of the heart valve. And then also there's commonality between a part of the brain called basal ganglia, and uh, this is uh, also where the uh, choreiform movements come in Sydenham's Korea after a strep uh, infection and uh, the neurologic manifestation of rheumatic fever. Patients can also experience arthralgia or pain in the joints because, again, similar, similarities to different epitopes, uh, glomerular nephritis in the kidney, and other effects. So you can see now the common sequence homology and how this can lead to an immunological attack against some of these different parts of the body. Well, we see that also with Lyme. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi also has sequence homology, and that's been published with streptococcal M protein. So why is that important? Well, I just showed you how the M protein contributes to many of these different types of conditions, including arthritic pain, other types of uh, cardiovascular uh, brain uh, attack in the basal ganglia. And in fact, the uh, publication here that I'm uh, showing you, uh, the anti uh, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi IgM cross-react with strep pyogenes uh, and mice, and both which share sequence homology uh, to Borrelia burgdorferi outer surface protein A suggesting a role for molecular mimicry in the generation of these uh, autoreactive antibodies. Um, again, th there are many more disorders that are, are now being understood to be associated or even triggered through molecular mimicry. I mentioned Guillain-Barre and Sydenham Korea, well, even lupus, uh, SLE, MS, myesthesia gravis, myocarditis, Crohn's disease, diabetes type 1, psoriasis, and the list goes on. Uh, you can look uh, up that particular article by Cusick and see how prevalent many of these chronic disorders 
uh, have some commonality between some type of a trigger and this connection to this immunological component directed against a similar target that has sequence homology. So uh, let's move over to the autoimmune neurologic and psychiatric disorders that are known as PANDAS and PANS. Many of you may be treating patients with PANDAS and PANS, uh, also known as neurologic Lyme or post-Lyme syndrome, and even more recently, what's now known as long COVID uh, or post-COVID syndrome. And how these and why these tend to be associated with particular infections. So I mentioned the sequence uh, homology importance in which uh, these particular organisms tend to show up more frequently. I mentioned strep in the case of pandas and pan, or, or at least far as Sydenham, Korea, and rheumatic fever, but it's also uh, associated with pandas. Uh, influenza A, and we've seen many different types of components that uh, have, uh, or disorders that may have arisen from that. In fact, one, narcolepsy, which is now very well characterized uh, as a uh, molecular mimicry post-influenza A. Varicella zoster, mycoplasma, we mentioned Lyme or Borrelia, uh, Babesia bartonella, Coxsackie virus, and others. These tend to be more frequently associated and they'll probably be more common in your patients that have these. Again, we believe because there's the sequence homology. It's not to say that there wouldn't be other infections and in fact, there typically are in these patients. And some of that we believe is because that the immune system is then compromised and the patient becomes more susceptible to multiple other infections including those of the herpes virus family and various other types of uh, infections. So over the past 30 years, medical research has demonstrated this connection between infections and neuropsychiatric disorders. This is a, a journal, uh, the JAMA Psychiatry article that was published in 2019. And uh, it actually uh, reflected a study, a Danish study that followed over a million individuals from birth to age 18. In uh, Denmark, they have a, a very uh, careful tracking system in hospitalization and patients so that this can be done. Um, and what they found after studying over these million patients uh, over this 18 year time span, that if they were hospitalized for a severe infection, that the risk of developing mental disorders increased by more than 80%. Uh, diagnosis such as schizophrenia, autism, OCD, ADD, ADHD, personality and behavioral disorders, and even tick disorders, and many more. So the um, editorial that accompanied this particular article said, how could exposure to infections affect the brain mechanistically to give rise to mental disorders? Uh, and they said that circulating autoantibodies that enter the brain via a compromised blood-brain barrier bind to neurotransmitter receptors and is a potential explanation. And this mechanism has been proposed in pandas and other mental disorders. And I'll show you with clinical data how uh, we actually do see this actually uh, is a common um, finding. And again, um, we won't go into the part about the blood-brain barrier, but uh, there is a compromisation of the blood-brain barrier and the serum autoantibodies traverse the blood-brain barrier and bind to parts of the brain, which we'll discuss in just a moment. So how does it occur biologically? Well, as I mentioned, these infections, we all get infections, microbial, viral, fungal, other, and these infections then will trigger our immune system to produce antibodies that are directed against epitopes of these particular infectious agents. However, in some patients, uh, the epitopes that are stimulating or the patients that de develop these antibodies against epitopes that are cross-reactive get through through the process we demonstrate are called molecular mimicry and that it interrupts the brain and the brain functions and we mentioned friendly fire that trigger and result in many of these symptoms that are found in neuropsychiatric disorders anxiety, rage, hyperactivity, insomnia, phobias, and many other, depending upon the target of which these particular antibodies are directed against. Um, these patients typically will be placed on symptomatic treatment 
And many of these cases, it, when it's not antibody induced or immune mediated, it will help patients uh, at least cope or resolve. But in the cases when it is autoantibody or it's immune mediated, what you'll find is that these symptomatic treatments don't actually uh, show much effectiveness. In some cases, it might even be worse. In some cases, it might help, but it certainly doesn't alleviate the situation. And more recently, what we do know is SARS-CoV-2 <clears throat> or the uh, virus of uh, COVID-19 uh, has been found to create an immun immunological response um, that is directed against the brain and also in other neurologic components, but also against the heart and the cardiovascular system. So we'll see myocarditis, uh, other types of cardiovascular effects, but also uh, we'll see neurologic effects. So the medical challenge really is that these types of disorders are diagnosed symptom by symptoms. And for instance, uh, let's say a patient might have uh, motor or vocal tics for more than 12 months. Uh, by definition, uh, that is the definition of Tourette's syndrome. Uh, you can see, as you know, others like hyperactivity, anxiety, irritability, and there's no other causative reason. You know, this is uh, something that might fall into the category of ADHD. Uh, and, the, and the list goes on. The point here really is that the disorders that uh, we've described in far as neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral have historically been classified by symptoms. And that has nothing to do with the underlying etiology. And this is important because when you treat the underlying root etiology, you'll have better success in actually resolving the symptoms. Now let's move over to nomenclature because there's a lot uh, in uh, out there and it's important, but sometimes it can be confusing. Uh, PANDAS is, is described as pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with a strep infection. And uh, it, it is a medical model for many of these disorders. Um, but we also know that other in infections, such as Lyme, myco mycoplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, and we described many others, can also trigger similar types of uh, conditions. It's also believed and understood that environmental and other biological factors can contribute, uh, including mold, mycotoxins, and other types of uh, environmental components. And so the categorization brings us to classifying these in those that have infectious triggers and those that are non-infectious. Um, and this is where the, the term PANS came in 2015 uh, by a group of clinicians and researchers that met at Stanford and uh, uh, published in the Journal of uh, Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology, uh, the term PANS, which is pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndromes. Well, another term called ANDL, uh, has been described as autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme, or sometimes it's uh, referred to as adult neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme. And if you combine all of them, we're seeing more and more the usage of autoimmune encephalopathy or autoimmune encephalopathy secondary to infection or basal ganglia encephalitis. On the importance of this, it doesn't eliminate or eliminate adults, so, and it doesn't uh, sort of uh, target only as children or strep or any particular microbe. And I think this is important as we move towards uh, a more etiologic classification and uh, identify as we uh, begin to identify better diagnostics and treatments that patients can then be more rapidly uh, treated uh, to the underlying root. So if we look at those, at least those three uh, syndromes and, and symptoms and disorders, there are commonalities. Um, again, they're all infection triggered in these cases, bacterial, viral, parasitic, fungal. Um, they're also known to be autoimmune or immune, immune mediated through the adaptive immune system. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about what parts here in just a moment, but neuropsychiatric symptoms are heterogeneous. It can be anything from OCD, uh, motor vocal tics, eating disorders, urinary issues, emotional ability, et cetera. 
And uh, we find that they're directed against uh, at least uh, certain portions of the brain, including in maybe predominantly the basal ganglia, but there's probably other components that they're directed towards. In the case of pandas and pans, there's, a, there's an, acute, uh, an acuity of onset. But uh, we do also see in these other conditions like Andal, uh, they're, they're not uh, observed as acute. And then, of course, by definition, pandas and pans are pediatric. Um, so you can't technically have pandas or pans as an adult, which is why we believe the importance to move to a term like autoimmune encephalopathy. In fact, I did a PubMed search of peer-reviewed published articles here. Uh, and last year, there was almost 1,800 articles being published uh, in, uh, with the term autoimmune encephalopathy describing some part of the syndrome or the underlying biology or treatments. This is also true for autoimmune neurology, neuroimmunology, uh, neuroinflammatory disorders, etc. So we're seeing more of a movement towards understanding the root or the etiology so that there will be a better way to diagnose and treat the patients rather than just symptomatically. So while we're on pandas, pans, and those of you are probably very familiar with this, um, I'll just briefly describe the diagnostic uh, criteria. Uh, it's estimated that one and out of 150 to 200 children uh, may have this disorder. Uh, it's described as far as pandas is concerned, the presence of OCD or a tick disorder, uh, of course, prepubertal onset as a child, acute symptoms, and then temporal association between group A and a number of other associated neurologic abnormalities. The PANDAS criteria is a bit more precise in the sense that uh, it still has an abrupt uh, dramatic onset, um, but then, then there's uh, of OCD and or a food uh, restrictive intake, and this is not to be confused with anorexia per se, uh, because this is tends to be more of a food, uh, fear of food contamination, a fear of choking, rather than a body image type uh, of component. And then the current presence of additional neuropsychiatric symptoms, and at least two of the following, uh, anxiety, emotional ability, irritability, behavioral regression, deterioration, school performance, sensory or motor abnormalities, urinary frequency, etc., and then, uh, of course, uh, this is a rule out condition in the sense where uh, it's not better explained by any other known neurologic or medical disorder. So it's also been published that brain inflammation occurs in children who have a streptococcal infection with OCD and ticks. Uh, in, the, in this case, what uh, they published and showed that on average, the size of the caudate, the patamen, and the globus pallidus, which is also portions of the, the um, basal ganglia, were enlarged in these patients, whereas in the thalamus it wasn't, which is not a part of the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia is an important part because it's also involved in other movement disorders like Parkinson's and Huntington's disease. So if you go back to the functions of the basal ganglia, it's responsible for these biological functions of voluntary motor control. So you can see the connection between if the basal ganglia is impacted, maybe this could be the contribution to tics, motor tics, vocal tics, et cetera. Procedural learning, you can see that maybe there is that connection between cognitive dysfunction uh, and, and uh, regression in learning. Uh, of course, the cognitive functions and the emotional functions, rage, anxiety, aggression, uh, phobias, fears, and then even eye movement. If we come back to today, we see that uh, one in three uh, patients with post-COVID or have had COVID-19 are diagnosed with some form of neuropsychiatric condition within the next six months. Uh, and it's been now more and more well understood that this is an immunological phenomenon rather than uh, a, a viral presence or a persistence. Um, the term long COVID has been coined and uh, other names for it, post-COVID syndrome, but it kind of brings back to the condition of myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome in which uh, we see very similar syndromes of fatigue uh, and these uh, post-exertional malaise, memory problems, et cetera. And, I, and it's 
very likely that this will help in the sense of understanding or bringing research um, to that condition um, because this seems to be very prominent in patients that have long COVID. Uh, another one is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, otherwise known as MIS, uh, and the commonality to Kawasaki's uh, syndrome, which is known to be uh, an autoimmune disorder. And as you can see, um, the struggle to classify this, but the comment here is that molecular mimicry uh, can also result in an immune response directed towards these particular tissues uh, here listed uh, the nose, the heart, the skin, eyes, etc. This has, hasn't been published yet, but we're preparing to do that in the near future. The sequence homology between the dopamine receptors and which we look at for autoantibodies that are directed against this and the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So uh, the dopamine uh, receptors uh, in, in the human brain, uh, there are some sequence homologies between the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and the D2 loop, uh, the first and second loops, there's uh, seven loops that go in through this uh, into and outside of the membrane. But what you can see here is that there's sequence homology between both the loop of the dopamine D1 and or the D2 rather, and then also the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We believe that this may be again a molecular mimicry component and a reason why uh, this could be the reason that you see some of these different types of neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders. In fact, uh, there's lots of publications that are demonstrating or showing um, this commonality and association uh, with post-COVID syndrome. So this is your challenge, <clears throat> and that is for you who are working with patients with chronic autoimmune encephalopathies that are secondary to infection, um, you're actually solving problems or looking at ways how the immune system combined with infections, psychiatry, <clears throat> and neurology actually are interrelated. Uh, and so we, we really applaud you and we're here to help uh, because that's really our uh, desire here is to provide uh, biological evidence, but also give laboratory evidence of what's going on underlying with your patients. So let's move over to how the targets of the Cunningham panel can be utilized to help identify and even direct treatment to these patients with these immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders. So the Cunningham panel really is just an aid in the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalopathy and basal ganglia encephalitis. Uh, by definition, PANDAs and PANS and others like that are diagnoses made by a clinician they are based on clinical symptoms and other things that were listed there, if not at today, uh, something that's diagnosed or made by the presence or absence of something that is uh, either biological or laboratory evidence. We believe that that, that will change over time uh, as more and more research is proven. These are the targets within the Cunningham panel, the dopamine D1 receptor, the D2 receptor, the lysoganglia side, again, remember about the myelin sheath. Tubulin, which is an uh, intracellular protein that's highly concentrated in the brain. And then another uh, complex assay we call calmodulin cam kinase 2. If you'd like to go to the website, you can see a video pictorial uh, video of how these actually um, are working and what it is we're looking at in these different components. That's on our website at molecularlabs.com. We do collect, have blood collected, uh, two red top tubes. I won't go into the collection component, but it is important that you use red top tubes because we're looking really for um, the sample that has no other interfering substance, such as heparin or any kind of lithium or anything else uh, in, in the tube. So here's what the panel results look like. Uh, you'll see a report that will have the five different targets listed and the level of these antibodies that we've identified at the time the serum or the blood was collected. Because it's a biological assay, these will change over time and certainly with patient improvement or treatment. Uh, Dr. Amram Katz sent us uh, this information based on 112 patients that he studied uh, and had testing 
And we find this the case now, since we've tested over 13,000 patients now to date, that the D1 tends to be uh, related to psychiatric syndromes uh, or symptoms. We also see D2 tend to be more related to movements. Talk with this a little bit more in detail in just a second. The lysoganglia side often found with more neuropathic uh, symptoms, even tics. And then antitubulin often associated more cognitive complaints like OCD and brain fog. And then the CAM kinase uh, associated with involuntary movements and adrenergic activation like the fight or flight types of syndrome. Uh, and one other thing, we tend to see it associated with a current or recurrent infection that has not been treated. So these are binding assays. This is a, a unique cell stimulatory assay in which we incubate the serum on top of human neuronal brain cells, not the patient's brain cells, but a cell line that is a brain cell line that will look at whether or not the serum autoantibodies will activate the CAM kinase through incorporation of radi radiolabel P32. So let's talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, D1 and D2 receptor. When antibodies are directed against the D1 or D2 receptor, they can either act as what we call agonist or antagonist, meaning if the antibody is acting as an antagonist, it's blocking dopamine from entering the receptor. If it's acting as an agonist, meaning the antibody will actually bind to the receptor and function as if it was dopamine, uh, it will be an agonist. We do see antibodies functioning in both those capacities. Now, we don't give that result in the testing um, because it would require much more detailed in-depth testing, but we do see it in the research side. So you'll see whether or not a patient has antibodies against D1 or D2, which uh, again, is not a great thing to have. So again, we see this was associated with psychiatric symptoms, correlate with mood, mood instability, anxiety, et cetera. There are other uh, receptor uh, associated types of symptoms. And if you have a new report recently within the last several months for your patient, you'll see behind it on the second and third page, there'll be these symptoms that we have listed here after collecting these from uh, many, many of our patients and finding these association. With the D2, I mentioned we see this more with movement symptoms, choreiform movements and other things, um, but there are other types of correlation again, um, but principally we see heavy correlation with movement. Tubulin is also thought to be in the past just a structural protein, but as you can see from up here, this particular publication, uh, when there were deletions and mutations in the tubulin, there were uh, identified patients with various types of things like dystonia, ALS, autism, et cetera. And what we do find is that when antibodies are directed against tubulin, uh, it tends to be associated with more cognitive interference like brain fog. We also see other types of symptoms associated at different frequencies. And you can see that list there. And then antibodies against the lysoganglioside GM1, again, uh, recalling that this has to do with those, um, the myelin sheath or the covering around the nerves, tends to be associated with tics, but also complaints of joint or connective tissue pain. Uh, again, there are other types of uh, symptoms seen like sleep disturbances. And then we get to the CAM kinase activity, which is really a, a very complex assay. Uh, as I mentioned, we use radio-labeled isotopes to identify this. Uh, the significance is that, that we find that it is associated with uh, activation of the sympathetic or the parasympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system, such as the flight or fight behavior. Um, this is another reason why you may see medriasis or pupil dilation in patients. Um, this uh, adrenergic activity uh, is actually something that is being stimulated by an antibody. And so the CAM kinase is an important uh, assay that, that gives you an association of whether or not this patient has these antibodies that are stimulating this at particular activity. The other thing, as I mentioned, is we find an association with an active infection, subclinical, or a reactivation of another infection. And often that may be a subclinical in which there may or may not be actual disease symptoms of the particular uh, organism or the uh, infection. So um, we also see from this that CAM kinase 2 
is also interrelated with the NMDR receptor, the GABA receptor, uh, the voltage-gated uh, receptor, calcium channel receptor, and other receptors. Uh, this is still an evolving field, um, but what you can see is that uh, if a patient has an activated CAM kinase enzyme, that there may be multiple different types of sy symptoms that a patient would experience. I'm going to quickly go through, you can pull this publication up on our website or here at the Journal of Neuroimmunology. We really looked at patients pre and post treatment, whether or not they improved or didn't improve after treatment, not necessarily why or for what treatments, but whether or not their antibodies were present or absent afterwards and looked at the symptom correlation with the sensitivity and specificity. We found that these patients had multiple infections, as I mentioned before. You can see, again, the bad actor showing up, but also some of the, several of these others. And they all had very similar symptoms in those that improved or those that didn't. And they were uh, classified or categorized as either pandas pans or presumptive pandas pans. So in the group, uh, the testing prior to their treatment, all of individuals had at least one or more autoantibodies present in this particular group that was treated and then also their symptoms improved or completely resolved, their post-treatment tests look like this. And so what we find is a very high correlation with the presence of these autoantibodies and these positive tests with patients who actually have these symptoms and then the absence of it after they improved. Conversely, those patients who did not improve, their testing prior to treatment Although there are still some groups who did not have antibodies present, over time we found that their antibodies began to show up. Um, and so actually in these patients who didn't improve, their numbers of test positives and frequency of positive were increased. That uh, calculated to a sensitivity and specificity listed there, an accuracy of 86%. We're working on an algorithm that will help us weight these differently, that would help us give better accuracy and we find that we can find, uh, actually get to a 90% uh, accuracy. I'll give you just a few couple case studies really quickly. We have hundreds of these in which this is a 24-year-old young male who started developing OCD and tics. He lost 30 pounds. Again, this was a food phobia, inability to concentrate, et cetera. He had one positive, and this was the CAM kinase positive. Uh, he was treated with IVIG and plasma phoresis, and all his symptoms were reduced and went back to normal. All his antibodies went back to normal. This one demonstrates the importance of early detection. This is a nine-year-old girl who had OCD and uh, autism-like stimming behavior, verbal tics, couldn't concentrate, uh, bedwetting, dysgraphia. Three uh, positive, two positive and one borderline. Turns out that they did ultimately find that as a result of a positive test, that there was an underlying infection. The patient was treated with azithromycin and complete and rapid improvement of all our symptoms. All our antibodies went back to normal. So what we see in patients that are diagnosed here is this is Adam Elliott is one of hundreds of examples. He was diagnosed with ADD and they thought he also had autism. They were going to place him in an institution. Um, they found out that uh, about the testing. This was many years ago. Uh, and just more recently, his mother sent us a picture of him running cross country in high school saying recovery is possible. He's 10,000 times better. There are other publications that uh, you can look up on uh, the use of the Cunningham panel in autoimmune encephalopathy in children with autism, in Lyme, post-treatment Lyme disease. Uh, and so if you're interested, let us know. Um, there, we can send you publications. Uh, that you might find important or interesting to your, your work. So briefly, in the limited time left, I want to touch on the treatment modalities that have shown clinical effectiveness in autoimmune encephalopathy secondary to disease, uh, secondary to infection. Uh, they tend to follow in, in these different uh, categories. So again, there's a stimulus, there's infection of some form, um, the anti-inflammatory immune modulators uh, to treating the immune system, and then uh, occasionally there's temporary symptomatic relief, uh, and this sometimes includes low-dose SSRIs uh, and even CBD, cognitive behavioral therapy. 
we move on here. So if you're looking for some more specific information, the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology has a series of articles in 2017 about the treatment and management of PANDAS and PANS. And again, we can uh, get those to you if you're interested. But they kind of fall to these three different categories of mild, moderate, and extreme cases. And uh, again, you can see treatment with uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory corticosteroids, et cetera, uh, in these moderate cases, looking at IVIG and even therapeutic plasma exchange, uh, and sometimes even uh, the use of rituximab. So this particular antibiotic used in PANDAS and PANS was also published in JCAP. What you see here is compared to controls of placebo, uh, the decrease in the uh, yellow global tick severity score, uh, and you can see change in motor ticks, change in phonic uh, vocal ticks, and then the overall score reduction with the treatment of a 30-day treatment of septinar. Plasma exchange and IVIG, an older study looking at IVIG and plasma exchange, and uh, the yellow brown global tick or the obsessive compulsive disorder score. Uh, all dropping in these patients compared to controls, uh, but not in placebo. And this was a single uh, five, uh, I'm sorry, five single volume exchanges over two weeks for the plasma exchange and at one gram per kilo per day on two consecutive days for the IVIG. You can see recommendations can vary between one gram, one and a half to two grams per kilo. Um, but uh, again, uh, you can read those references. Another uh, IVIG treatment study that was completed in 2020 by Octopharma. This is 21 patients who were enrolled at three independent sites. They gave one gram per kilo every 21 days for a cycle of uh, six um, successive treatments. I believe that there was six. They measured pre and post the uh, Ybox, uh, the Yale Brown Global, uh, the Global Tick Severity Score. Uh, and other types of activities. And you can see uh, the consistent drop or the improvement in these scores, and in some cases, very dramatic improvement in these scores. Um, rituximab has been used and, and uh, is also uh, something that we know has been used to remove B cells. And again, if you think of B cells, they're the ones that produce these antibodies. Uh, there is a caution to be sure that the prescriber um, has uh, familiarity with using it, but in very complex and very severe cases, these patients uh, have been seen to recover uh, very nicely. So overall, to sum it up here, uh, including pandas and pans and other autoimmune encephalopathies, you want to rule out what the other causes are and establish a correct diagnosis. Uh, you also want to identify and treat all the infections, whether it's bacterial, viral, fungal, because again, they're stimulating the immune system if they're present. Then you want to provide symptomatic relief if necessary, and then treat the inflammation and the immune dysfunction. And this particular sequence or these types of treatments, as mentioned, and many others that fall under those categories tend to be the most effective. So we believe that this is the tip of the iceberg, neurologic Lyme, pandas and pans, and that many of these follow uh, along as a very similar etiology. So I'm gonna leave you with um, a, a TAC law that I've adapted from Dr. Sidney Baker. The TAC law number one is says, if you're sitting on a TAC, the treatment for TAC sitting is not too Advil every three to four hours. The treatment for tax sitting is tax removal, and sort of the corollary to that is you want to look for what the underlying root is, and rather than treating the symptoms. Uh, the second tax law is that is if you're sitting on two tax, removing one tax doesn't eliminate 50% of the symptoms. So uh, this is to the uh, treat towards complex disorders are very complex, and often there's multiple components to it. So to be effective, you have to address all the underlying issues. And by doing that, we know that autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders, although they're complex, they are treatable. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you for being uh, attentive and listening and for being on this webinar. Uh, we're here to help and do everything that we can to help support you as you work at the front line to take care of and improve the lives of your patients. Um, so I'm going to close there, turn it back over to Ryan, 
Um, and if we have a chance for questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Well, thanks, Craig. Um, so a lot of great content in those slides and in that presentation. And as mentioned, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar within two to three days. But there were some questions around the accessibility of the slides themselves. So um, are, are those available for download or, or sending out? Yes, yes. Um, these will be uh, sent out, I think, in a few days after in the entire recording. Um, but I think it'll the way that this will work is it'll uh, a link will be sent back to which will get a link to back to uh, a landing page great great uh and then it looks like a comment maybe you could just comment on it is uh variable and transient response is often observed with these therapies which are individually select selective in benefit just a caveat so I don't know if you have right right and thank you dr traver for for that comment because that's an important comment uh, and there are various reasons for that. This is not like uh, one condition you treat with one particular therapy or one, one disorder you treat with one particular treatment. Um, as you see that it's complex, uh, if you're experiencing maybe multiple infection or the patient has multiple infections, treating two out of three and then treating the, maybe the inflammation, you'd probably see some improvement, but you wouldn't see complete improvement because maybe there's a contribution to another infection or a different infection that's not responding to those particular uh, anti-infective agents. Or treating the immunotherapy without treating the underlying infections may not necessarily completely improve it. So it's important, and this is where we're trying to build algorithms that can help predict treatment efficacy, that unfortunately it's a trial and error uh, because uh, without guidance or understanding of what all is causing or triggering this, to what degree, um, there are effectiveness and difference in effectiveness to various therapies, and often it's not just one. Great. And then another question came in, and, and we saw uh, one of the cases, I believe it was a 24-year-old. Um, but so can the Cunningham panel be useful for adults? Um, yes, it, it, it certainly can. And uh, we see about maybe anywhere from 15 to 20 percent or more of the patients that are now coming for testing or at least coming in for testing uh, are adults. Um, one of the important things is that if you see multiple tests or these results that are highly elevated or elevated above baseline, uh, it is an indicator that there is an infection triggered autoimmune condition going on. Uh, now, the caveat of that is our normal controls are pediatric population. Uh, and although they're pediatric normals, um, we also know that in some adults, there may be and tend to be slightly higher, quote unquote, normals, not all adults. Um, so we're in the process of collecting uh, uh, adult normals, and how you define normal is always interesting. Uh, but adult normal so that we can develop uh, an adult uh, normal range. And that's something that's ongoing. Great. And then uh, another question here. So um, this person sees parents of children with Lyme or pans and pandas. And, you know, often these clients are, are very desperate to understand why their children have such an array of severe uh, neuropsychiatric syndromes, uh, symptoms. So I, I know we, we you work in partnership with many of these associations, but are there specific events or, or maybe avenues for you to uh, present uh, to these groups of people that you would recommend? Yeah. So Ryan, you know, that might be one opportunity. We know we have one event coming up next week that is more geared towards uh, parents um, that maybe if uh, they can connect there with you, that we can get them a link to actually that parent webinar um, that will be similar content, but more directed towards parents. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, and then it looks like there's another question in the chat. Uh, Dr. Shimasaki, if you want to read this one from, uh, from Sophie. And uh, she's got some patients with Lyme who have de developed, it looks like, Parkinson's uh, yeah. or involuntary movements. Uh, have you seen this? And have you had a particular pattern or, of antibodies associated with these symptoms? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, Lyme and Babesia and developed Parkinsonism and other involuntary movements. Um, so uh, Parkinson's also, uh, the version of Parkinson's is also understood to, to have an, uh, an immune etiology. But again, the diagnosis of Parkinson's is also based on symptoms. And so there could be, uh, in many cases, um, maybe multiple components to that. Uh, 
you did see and we do see uh, that infection triggers can create these abnormal motor movements and they do respond in that, those cases when it is autoimmune to those different types of therapy. Um, there is the possibility that these could be comorbid, in, comorbid conditions uh, and that uh, treating one may get a person to a baseline. Um, but th there, there is definitely an association with uh, seeing these types of infection triggers and movement disorders. Uh, I can't sp speak directly to say in the case of Parkinson's or if it may maybe Parkinsonian-like. Um, but again, if it's movement disorders that are due to infection-triggered autoimmune conditions, they certainly may or could respond to it, and we would pick up likely pick up these antibodies in a patient that's presenting with those symptoms if that's the case. Great, thank you. And we are two minutes over. Uh, we, perhaps we have time for one more question if, if one comes in, but uh, may, maybe while we wait for a final question to come in, Dr. Shimasaki, any final comments or closing comments as we wrap up here today? Yeah, let me just thank all of you because you're at the front line and uh, we really appreciate uh, your work. We're here to help. Uh, we're a research-based organization. Uh, I kiddingly tell people we're nonprofit, but not on purpose because uh, we still work to try to, even though the test price uh, runs about 925 and 975, um, it still doesn't cover all of our costs. But as we work to raise capital and do that, um, we're also doing that to help uh, conduct more clinical studies, develop more uh, inclusive or maybe even broad array of testing, but also help to lead to future therapeutics. So if you have an interest or you have something you would like to talk to us about, uh, please do reach out and let us know. Or if you just need some help, um, we're happy to do what we can. We're a very small organization, but this is the reason we started the, the company is that we want to help change how medicine is practiced for patients with neurologic and psychiatric disorders. Well, great. Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Shimasaki, and thank you everyone for joining our webinar. Um, as a reminder, you will be emailed a recording of this presentation within two to three days. Um, but if you have any further questions or would like to schedule perhaps a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, Dr. Shimasaki, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, as he mentioned, we also have some upcoming webinars, some being uh, parent-focused and patient-focused that will be sure to include you on as well. Um, and uh, as a reminder, uh, thank you for joining us again, and we look forward to continuing the conversation and partnership. So thank you and have a great weekend. Thank you.